and welcome to the Texas System of Care Cultural and Linguistic Competence Podcast. My name is Shannon Moreno, and I'm the CLC, or Cultural and Linguistic Competence Specialist, with Texas System of Care. This podcast is devoted towards how to work with specific populations within your local system of care community, and ensure that you're providing services that are culturally and linguistically appropriate. This series is focused on working with African American youth and their families. For a further explanation of CLC terminology, including terms used in this podcast, we recommend checking out the ABCs of CLC webinar series. Today we're joined by Dr. Regina Hicks, Juvenile Probation Officer and Health Services Division at Harris County Juvenile Probation in Houston, Texas. Dr. Hicks, thank you so, so much for joining us this morning for our podcast on working with the African-American community. Um, I know that you are very, very busy. Um, You come with a lot of expertise within the mental health field. Currently working at Harris County Juvenile Justice, where you started off this mental health gel diversion program and have expertise in regards to the link between juvenile justice and behavioral health concerns. But even before that, you have a really, really long history working within the behavioral health system, um, coordinating with SAMHSA, working on different uh, cultural competence initiatives, clinical background, really big systemic lens as well, um, which we're going to be talking about a lot in the podcast today about some systemic issues as well as kind of more in the weeds clinical issues that we want our listeners to to be able to hear about from your experience and expertise in regards to working with the African-American population. So thank you again so, so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, and it is uh, very exciting to, to participate in this. Um, as you said, I've done a lot of work at the, at the federal level on national initiatives and I think that's something that's really important to see how those federal policies have really trickled down into the day-to-day work that we're all involved in. Um, Right now, my job with Harris County Juvenile Probation is focusing on expanding services to youth that have behavioral health needs. And one of the things that we see on a day-to-day basis is the overrepresentation of youth of color, particularly African American and Latino youth in our juvenile justice system. So that intersection of looking at race and culture and services is still very much a part of my day-to-day world. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so thank you again for um, joining us and, and being able to bring that perspective. And um, in our conversation, I think we're going to kind of go back and forth, Bob, and weave a little between um, kind of that clinical focus and that systemic focus, because I think with a lot of the populations that we talk about, you know, having competence and and working with um, in this podcast series, having that lens for institutional concerns is incredibly important. um, And that absolutely rings true when we when we talk about working with the African American community as well. We can't just focus on individual factors, um, but we also have to look at the family, the larger community, and society as a whole in regards to this population. So I'm really, really excited for this conversation today, so thank you again. Um, To start off, um, you know, anytime that we talk about a population as a whole, we need to be very careful um, because we have to, by nature, be talking in generalizations uh, that are not necessarily going to ring true for absolutely every single individual within that community. Um, So can you talk a little bit about the diversity within the African-American um, community and also within that, I think that that goes hand in hand with an explanation of the difference between the terms um, African-American and, and black and why those terms might sometimes be used interchangeably or sometimes they're used very purposefully and distinctfully um, in regards to understanding the diversity within this community? Sure, and and that's a that's a real good place to start. I oftentimes like to enter in that that conversation or looking at that topic from my own personal experience. I was born in the early to mid fifties, um, and and with that, I tell people that I have gone through my own evolution in terms of what I have called myself or how I've identified myself. 
as well as how society has identified me. I was born in Birmingham, and on my birth certificate, it says uh, that I was colored. Uh, when I started elementary school in kindergarten, I was a Negro, and then I went on to become an Afro-American, and then I went on to become very oftentimes referred to as black and, and now as African-American. And I, and I think what that really reflects is what it has meant for people who came to America and came to other places not of their own volition and what it means to want to have the opportunity to kind of continue to define yourself in relationship to in relationship to the broader culture the terminology that people will use a lot of times pretty much interchangeably right now is using the term african american or using the term black and within that what we're talking about is again, a very diverse group of individuals. You're talking about people who have been born in the United States, whose major connection or ancestry as you know, when we talk about people right now really being very popularized and looking at Ancestry.com and all those things of, of primarily a lot of people seeing that their original African roots are part of West Africa. You're also talking about people who are of African descent, who are from the Caribbean, who might define themselves as being Afro-Caribbean. And then you're also talking about people who would be immigrants who have come to this country recently or many years ago, such as uh, people who are native Africans from Nigeria, from Somali, and the like. And so when we're talking about that in terms of the community, the black community or the African-American community, those are all of the all of the different cultural groups that are kind of comprised with within that. And then you also have to add into what it means to have people coming from different geographical regions where they might have language differences just in terms of some things being different as far as dialect is concerned, as well as even what it means to have child rearing and other types of practices that are also influenced by where you grow up. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, because I I think that it can be very easy um, in discussing about issues that the African-American community faces or, you know, strengths within the African-American community um, for folks to forget that, you know, there is really that large diversity um, and there's specific reasons why an individual might prefer a specific term, uh, might prefer to be referred to um, or self-identify as black versus African-American or vice versa. Um, I think sometimes for folks that can be a little bit... um, confusing or or maybe hasn't been explained before. So thank you for that. And and it's always important for us to kind of open up these discussions with a a reminder, like I was saying before, um, that when we talk about cultural competence and discussing about populations at large, it is always meant to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt, that we're making generalizations and not to go too far to the point of of stereotyping um, and putting people in in boxes as far as, you know, we wouldn't want listeners to take away from this a message of, oh, because you are African-American, then you must have perspective X, Y, Z, or or feel this um, certain way, because for that individual, it may may not pan out to be true. Um, Dr. Hicks, could you uh, talk some about the strengths within the African-American community. We're certainly later in the conversation going to get to, like I was mentioning before, some of the uh, structural or institutional issues and concerns that uh, the African-American community at large tends to face in our society. But before we get there, I think it's really, really important to acknowledge the strengths. Um, can, can you speak to that? Oh, absolutely. And for me particularly, and I think for a lot of people, what has oftentimes happened with within communities that are different or or communities that that are not part of 
how we right now here in, in America would define as, as being part of the majority culture, there's always been a tendency to look at them from a deficit lens, that the way that they went about interacting with society the way that they went about establishing certain social norms or mores because it may have been different than that meant that it was that it was less than um i remember all during the 70s and into the and even into the the 80s there was a, a lot of discussion about looking at uh, at different groups being culturally deprived and it's kind of like how can anybody be deprived of a culture it just means that your your culture might be be different but some of what we have oftentimes looked at strengths within the within looking at the African American community um, has has been connected with having a strong religious orientation. Um, oftentimes, it's really been talked about how the church for many years has been a mainstay within the African American community as a place that people not only went for a level of spiritual support, but also in the past and even now, the church has continued to be a place where people can also get various aspects of of social support for themselves as well if if they were if they were in a time of need. Um, the other thing that oftentimes gets identified has been seen as there being a very, very much very strong kinship bonds or relationships with people who are part of your blood group, if you will, but also the fact that there has always been a tendency to expand that to what we would, the term that we would use of being called uh, fintictive kin, which means that you end up connecting with individuals that are not part of your original family of origin, but become part of that by virtue of the relationship that you establish with them. And so it's very common for um, to hear youth or, or family people, pe- um, adults talk about, well, that's my brother. And they say, that's your brother? I thought you only had four brothers. Well, no, that's my play brother. That's a term that people would use. Or, or that's my play sister, which means that throughout their lifetime, they've developed a relationship that was so close that now they identify they identify themselves in that way. And, and that has been another one of those strengths just in terms of what it's meant for people in terms of their day-to-day survival, but also what it means in terms of building that network that you need as a, as a human just to be able to have those various types of of social supports. Uh, the other one has that has been identified is having a strong educational or achievement orientation. And very oftentimes that's been something else that different researchers have looked at and they have made the assumption that because there is not the same level of achievement in terms of academic standards, for African American youth in terms of standardized tests, um, how they perform on the state tests and all of those things, they would hypo- they have hypothesized that that's because African American or black families are not do not value education, which is absolutely not the case. Most recently, um, there was a presentation that was done by a very prominent sociologist Dr. Steven Kleinberg at Rice University here in Houston and and his recent research really showed that within the African American community there continues to be a very strong connection to education and for kids to do better in terms of their education than than their than their previous family members but there but we do continue to have a difficulty with in terms of the rates of youth that are dropping out of school. And so for some people, that would be very, you know, very, a very conflictual statement to be made. But that's where we have to look at the other types of institutional practices as well as economic practices that might move some youth um, not to complete not to complete with school. The other thing that has been identified is that there has been a flexibility in roles 
an, an enrolled uh, configuration, and that specifically refers to the fact that within a lot of of African American families or families that have predominantly been here in the United States for 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 hundreds of years, there has not been that strong identification with gender specific roles, and some of that has been related to or credited to the fact that because in the majority of African American families, uh, both parents, if they, if it was a two parent family, or even if it was not a two parent family, there was that main provider that needed to work, and so therefore, whichever the old, whoever was the oldest child, be that a boy or be that a, a girl, they might have the task of helping to prepare the dinner while the parent was still out working, or helping with childcare. In in my situation, I was um, one of four girls, and my younger brother was the last one that was born into our family system. And so for many years, uh, I was teasingly told that I was my father's son. And what that meant by that, that I learned how to do a lot of things around the house and fixing things and the like that, that my other sisters didn't learn. And that was because I was the second eldest. And um, that was a role that I could take in terms of, in terms of helping, in, in terms of helping out helping out the family. So those are just a, a few of those things. I think that one of the other things that's important to look at is that a lot of those strengths were very much, much more predominant or much easier to see when communities were more connected within uh, a certain geographic area. Uh, what I meant by that, if, if you lived in the north side and that's where the majority of your other extended family members were, then there was more of the opportunity to continue to kind of nurture some of these, some of these positive traits that I had mentioned. What we're faced with now with things being so diverse and family members living in different uh, suburbs or in different parts of the country and the like is that people are really focusing on how to re recreate those types of relationships and keeping those strengths moving forward as part of their survival. Thank you so much for for addressing all of that. And I agree, Dr. Hicks, that it's that unfortunately so common um, for communities that are not of um, the majority culture to really be referred to solely through a deficit lens. And while it, it is important and, um, you know, part of today is certainly going to be talking about um, specific issues and concerns that a community faces, um, too often that's the only thing that is discussed or even those issues being framed uh, as being at the community's fault, that it's the community's fault that these situations are, are taking place, which we're going to um, kind of continue to delve into deeper today um, in discussing. But the every, every group of people on the face of this planet has specific strengths um, that are, are unique and are something that... Um, you know, we would hope that folks who are in one way, shape, or form interacting with providing services of, of one type or another um, to folks who belong to a specific community would, would be aware of and know how to tap into that. Um, as you were talking a minute ago about the strengths within the African-American community, I just kept thinking about the mismatch uh, between those strengths and some of the strengths of the majority culture that are intrinsically celebrated and kind of assumed to be true for everybody in the way our systems work. So for example, when you were talking about this idea of fictive kin um, and having a really strong relationship with family who may not technically be biologically family, but are very, very much, you know, a part of a young person's family, that certainly doesn't ring true to majority culture where there's much more of an emphasis for the nuclear family and very much a divide between that whole kind of like blood is thicker than water <laughs> type of an ideal um, is something that works for that particular um, 
culture, but obviously it's not, not true for everyone. But that's something that at an institutional level becomes assumed and becomes celebrated. Um, and that's just one example of, you know, for for example, within the child welfare system, if a family member is not able to be an actual placement for a child for whatever reason, let's say that maybe a grandmother is, her health is not well enough to be able to take in, you know, the, the children and make sure they're at school every day and all that, but she still could certainly be a very, very strong support in the life of those children. And she knows them well and as a source of information. Our system tends to not really value this kind of community, you know, the it takes a village to raise a child type of a, a perspective. And within the child welfare system, oftentimes if relatives are not able to actually be placement for one reason or another, um, they tend to just get, get cut out. And if we think of within our behavioral health services, even uh, in situations where maybe we are trying to do some form of family engagement, family therapy, perhaps um, utilizing wraparound practices, oftentimes we kind of don't live up to what we preach with that um, and also don't have engaged all of the different family members as the young person defines who their family members are um, in that process. So we can kind of start to see even early on in this conversation how there can be a mismatch between the strengths of the African-American community and the way that the systems that are meant to serve children and families in our state don't really honor those strengths, but tend to be framed around the majority culture. Yeah, just, just to, to tie into that a minute, I mean, it's, it's, it's real important for people to know that the whole notion of kinship care really evolved out of a need that had been seen within the African American community and what I was, what we, what you have been alluding to just in terms of what it meant for children to be embraced by within their biological family system and and which was also something that has always been very common of of what in the past sociologists have and uh, anthropologists have talked about as in terms of informal adoption or the fact that there would be children that would be taken in by other family members and sometimes even by non-family members but by those fictive kinned individuals and so then when it came time for them to uh, try to enroll them in school, they didn't have any legal papers, so to speak. Uh, when it came time with, within the child welfare system of, of that family member because the parent was not, for whatever reasons, able to care for their child, and they wanted to be able to do that and maybe were not considered because the house was too small or what up those other things were but but that was really what pushed that issue to be addressed was because of the large number of particularly children of color that were in that were in those situations and so that's just an example of about how something that at one point had been seen potentially been seen as something negative ended up being embraced and then turning into a very positive for the system as a whole Absolutely. And, and today, having more of an emphasis on that kinship uh, care is benefiting, you know, all children who end up right. being involved with the child welfare system. Um, Absolutely. But it, it started with paying attention to that disproportionality and trying to take a look at what, what could uh, work better specifically uh, with African-American community, which obviously, um, you know, the, the children are represented at much higher rates within the child welfare system than um, than other children. I hope you enjoyed today's CLC podcast. If you have any questions on how to bring CLC initiatives into your local system of care community, please feel free to email us at info at tx systemofcare.org.